Okay, well, great. So our next session includes a couple of investors that have been real global leaders from their own perspective. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Scott and Crystal to introduce themselves. They'll tell us a little bit about the perspectives that they're bringing to the conversation today. Scott, Crystal, welcome. Thanks for having us. Crystal, tell us a little bit about yourself, your company, You know, some of the uh, portfolio companies that you invest in. Sure. So I'm an investor at NEA, New Enterprise Associates. We're a global multi-stage venture capital firm that's been in the business for over 40 years. We invest across enterprise software, consumer technologies, and healthcare, um, and are investing our 17th fund, which is a $3.6 billion fund. Uh, we can invest at all stages from seed up to late stage uh, and have been very active on the e-commerce front across marketplaces, uh, retailers, direct-to-consumer brands, and increasingly on e-commerce infrastructure. So some of the companies that we've been fortunate to be involved with include Jet.com, where Scott was also an investor and friend on the board, uh, Groupon, Casper, Motor App Verandai, Goop, um, Burrow, which is a mattress, uh, which is a couch company, uh, and quite a few other D2C brands. And have been looking at e-commerce for a long time. In fact, back when I was just getting started in VC, uh, at a prior firm, the first memo I ever wrote was on a company called Wish. Um, so I've been thinking about cross-border commerce for a very, very long time and excited to join you. Yeah, we've had the Wish guys at Gelf before. Um, you know, obviously we've got the, uh, the, the team from Flow coming up next. Uh, you know, we've been chasing after Scott for years, uh, ever since, you know, some of the, the early investments in, in the Flow folks. So Scott, thank you for finally joining us. Why don't you say a quick hello? Yeah, thanks for having me. Nice to be here. Um, like, like Crystal, I, I'm, a, I'm a venture investor. I work at Bank Capital Ventures, the venture arm of, of Bank Capital. Um, we invest across the technology landscape, predominantly early stage. Uh, we've been fortunate to be involved in great companies over the years like Jet, along with uh, Crystal and her team, LinkedIn, DocuSign, a variety of others. I come from a commerce technology background. I, before becoming an investor 15 years ago, built a company in the commerce tech space, which we sold to Oracle, and have spent all of my time at Bank Capital focused on sort of the next generation of commerce and marketing infrastructure. Um, that's led us to a handful of direct-to-consumer and kind of next-gen retail-oriented investments like Jed and like Rent the Runway, where we've been the largest investor since the beginning. But my predominant focus is on infrastructure tools like Flow that help brands and retailers operate more effectively and compete more effectively in an increasingly global world. Got it. Well, thanks for both. You know, I'm going to lean on Crystal a little bit to talk to some of the, the direct-to-consumer and the digital natives, and, and Scott will help us out on some of the technology infrastructure. So you know, for those of you that joined us last fall at Oktoberfest, we, we heard a lot of stories from global e-commerce leaders about, you know, the incredible growth throughout the spring and, and into the fall, you know, citing order volumes that they saw weekly that looked a lot like your typical Cyber Week and, and Black Monday. We continued to see that as we've been doing some prep calls, um, some record January, February months. So, you know, I was looking at some data that we had on our virtual lunch and learn uh, last month and you know, cross-border e-commerce projections, I think, have changed from just over 400 billion in 2023 to now like 750 plus. So, you know, Crystal, maybe we'll start with you. What are you guys seeing as far as, you know, growth among your portfolio companies? And is this encouraging you to, you know, kind of double down or, or go even stronger after, you know, kind of your next round of investments in the e-commerce and the cross-border space? Yeah, absolutely. You know, there was really only a temporary lull early on last year, right, where there was a little bit of uncertainty in the market. But many of our companies actually then rebounded and, you know, had amazing Q4s and even better than we expected, right, and are able to raise more capital. And so we're actually super bullish on both e-commerce and, you know, companies that want to go cross-border. And there was a step function, you know, increase in the adoption of e-commerce last year, right? It accelerated a lot of trends that were already underway. And now there's just so much more wallet to grab and um, more sort of digitally digitally connected consumers who kind of don't know where the brand originates, right? And they're just kind of buying really great things. And so we're super bullish and, you know, glad that Flow happens to be partnering with a lot of those companies. Yeah. And Scott, you know, we had, as so we've been talking to e-commerce leaders, they're like, boy, I've had to lean on my partners more than ever. So, you know, maybe from a perspective of the, the solution providers and the infrastructure guys, you seeing the same thing? Are they, you know, growing as fast as their clients, if not faster? 
Yeah, you know, the um, the pandemic sadly has been this this period of have and have nots. And, and certainly the technology industry broadly has been in the have category. And I'd say it, that's been particularly true for technology companies that serve the commerce industry. Um, the, the desire for pipes and plumbing to facilitate better cross-border commerce, better infrastructure just to sell my goods more effectively to an increasingly online audience ramped dramatically in Q2 last year as all businesses were sort of getting used to this dramatic shift from what was for many a mix of online and offline to sort of a purely online environment for a period of time. So it's been kind of a heyday for technology vendors to serve this market. I think it's forced many of those vendors to up their games. They've hired, they've reinforced their technologies, they've sort of doubled down on customer success to make sure that their clients who were struggling early in the pandemic and have now thankfully come out the other end can, can have a real level of success. Um, but it, it has created tons of new opportunities for investment in the commerce and marketing technology arena. And I think sort of a rising tide for all of the, all of the vendors to play in this space. Yeah, and we'll come back to uh, some questions, you know, little, diving into that a little bit more. I think, you know, you're right, it's a silver lining. Another silver lining that we've seen is just this, this kind of consumer and just really universal focus on, on health and sustainability. And, and certainly um, one of the reasons we call this Summit Accelerate is because we've seen a lot of trends accelerate. Uh, the whole sustainability uh, mindfulness push is, is something that I think is going to have legs from this. Crystal, maybe talk a little bit about when you guys are looking at companies and, and kind of nurturing their growth, you know, where does sustainability fit into this, um, you know, both from a green and maybe a social mindfulness perspective? Yeah, definitely. It's something that's very important to us and it's always a work in progress, right? So we never have it 100% right. Um, our mission statement, actually, the first sentence reads, um, NEA empowers founders who are building vital change in the world. And so that kind of preference for companies that have a positive social impact has always really been ingrained in the firm. And in more recent years, we've put together an ESG committee. Um, we've updated a lot of our term sheets to reflect a commitment to things like you know, anti-harassment and having a, you know, a good sort of workforce policy. So we're doing a lot of that. Um, sustainability is one where we're thinking about it, but we need to figure out like, what are the right policies and expectations to embed in our portfolio. So we're working on it, but we're, I don't think we're there yet. Yeah, and as we, we will revisit this throughout the day, and you know, there, there are certainly challenges, you know, will, will customers support the push? You know, we're, we're seeing people, I, I know um, the, the flow team has done some interesting stuff with offering carbon offsets at checkout and things like that. So, you know, I, I think in many ways, this idea of um, cross-border and, and especially these innovative brands really pushing uh, sustainability is a way to really raise awareness around the world. So, you know, even if the, the, the first phase of, of cross-border you know, obviously has some impacts as far as shipping and things like that. I think this idea of getting these principles and practices in front of a global audience is going to have legs. Scott, anything you guys see from a sustainability perspective, you know, when you're, when you're looking, you know, maybe more at the technology stack and the infrastructure investments, certainly, you know, kind of lessening the distance between product and people is, is certainly a huge trend that we're seeing. Yeah. Um, I, I would say on a bunch of dimensions, like everyone in this audience, um, ESG related topics seem to be front and center in our conversations uh, across the broader bank capital, um, which has a, a global footprint and, and, and obviously assets in private equity and venture and debt and uh, life sciences and a bunch of other categories. We have for the first time this year hired a senior executive in charge of ESG across the firm and across the firm's portfolio and a whole team of folks sort of dedicated to evolving, helping our businesses evolve along that journey. So I think that's just an indication of sort of the elevated level of importance. And then I would say, you know, as it relates to cross-border in particular, um, I think to a great extent, the, 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 the brands and retailers that, that firms like Flow work with, and those in general that are, that are uh, participating in global commerce, aren't necessarily focused on do I need to ship this product from country A to country B or C? They're focused on how do I sell my product as effectively as possible to mm -hmm. an audience who's anywhere. And I may in fact have fulfillment center capability in those countries. 
where I have local inventory and there isn't necessarily a negative environmental impact on that shipping. And if I don't, I may be able to explore those possibilities over time. But I think the real, the real interesting trend where ESG has been sort of a subcomponent as opposed to sort of the primary has been this desire to reach an audience anywhere as flexibly as possible. And sort of the ESG pieces are what follow. And I think those will get increased attention over time. And just for the, the folks in the audience that are, are new to e-commerce potentially and certainly cross-border, ESG means? Well, for us, it, it, it's around environmental issues, sustainability, and governance. Got and it. that governance piece is particularly important because it gets to the heart of sort of how you're thinking as an organization about the policies and procedures to support those broader issues. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm in agreement with that. And um, a lot of it is also being attentive to sort of, you know, the moral considerations of your customers and always, you know, having a place, having a process for incorporating those and having what your customer base cares about be reflected in your product in your own processes as a business. Got it. You know, this whole idea of investing to, to kind of get closer to the consumer whether that's understanding what matters to them, their values, or, you know, as I mentioned earlier, just, just kind of physically getting product closer. Um, certainly, you know, we're seeing a lot of drop shipping, growth and drop shipping around the world. Um, there are challenges, especially with some of the digital natives, as far as being able to find, say, in-country retail partners to help, you know, ship from store, if you will. I mean, the, there's, you know, for years, we've, we've envisioned this, this idea where an order could come into your U.S. site and it could be immediately routed to the closest DC or retailer or other partner, you know, closest to that customer. Crystal, how do you look at, you know, kind of opportunities to invest in cross-border fulfillment for your, for your um, portfolio companies? We're seeing a lot of new businesses crop up that offer sort of flexible fulfillment centers targeted toward an SMB or mid-market company. And especially those are that are, you know, direct to consumer brands or sort of marketplace merchants on, you know, Amazon mm -hmm. and Walmart. So we're seeing many, many of those providers, uh, I think, come to market with just a better business model that's more attractive to smaller businesses, right? So, you know, very low minimums on how much you have to store in a given place or how much volume you need to do, better integration with some of the e-commerce tooling that they're using, um, and just like pricing models that align with a smaller business. So right. a lot of those sort of mid-market e-commerce warehouse services are cropping up now, especially I would say we're seeing a lot in Europe and obviously Shopify is blowing up a pretty you know, good network in, in the US and Canada. So um, it's a really viable option, right? And they're well-priced. And so it's very much democratized what you can do as a small business pretty quickly without having to pay up front for a lot of volume or storage. Yeah, certainly, you know, Amazon's success with, with all the fulfillment by Amazon services, we're seeing a lot of people trying to figure out how to, how to duplicate that. So, um, you know, Scott, maybe from a more of an infrastructure or technology, you know, where, where are you guys looking at global logistics? Well, you know, I, I'm particularly intrigued, and this is sort of a local issue versus a global issue, but it exists globally. I'm intrigued by this phenomenon that has been exacerbated by the pandemic and exacerbated by the, exacerbated by the growth in e-commerce um, that we all experience at home, which is the piling of boxes in our front halls or our doorways. And it's sort of, it's environmentally um, unpalatable and it is um, efficiency wise, just painful. Um, if you live in a town where you have to break down boxes and flatten them out before you get them out to the garbage, you sort of feel that problem in spades. And so what do you do about that? Um, does the world continue to need same day or next day delivery on everything from everybody? Or is there a universe where we make a decision as consumers, either based on efficiency or based on uh, motivation around environmental and sustainability issues to say, it doesn't matter that much to me to receive everything immediately. Maybe I can receive one shipment per week. And in that tote comes all of the items that I bought from everybody that I shop from, and maybe I return things the same way. And so I think we'll continue to see innovation that sort of fights against the trend of immediacy and yeah. balances out the sustainability benefits in parallel. Yeah, I think you're spot on. I mean, 
you know, the, the boxes around the house. People talk a lot about how, you know, the, the whole pandemic has been great for, for dogs, but I think cats have benefited more than any. I mean, the, the number of cats jumping from box to box that you see on, on you know, kind of YouTube and so forth and whatnot has been crazy. But no, I, I think you're right. I mean, it, it's something that, that we've looked at for years, you know, kind of this idea. You know, obviously one of the challenges, uh, you know, that folks like Flo and all the other folks in the cross-border platform has been, you know, trying to, to balance out the high cost of international shipping and, and, and the long delivery times. I know when we first did a survey probably about a decade or so ago, you know, we found that there was, especially with this rising global middle class, they were fine with one two week delivery. I mean, these were people that couldn't get their product locally. And if they could get it, it was just priced crazy high. So yeah, I think you're spot on with this idea of, you know, immediacy, maybe taking a little bit of a, a time out. I mean, we certainly learned during the, you know, March and April period that, you know, Amazon was struggling to get people packages within a week sometimes. And in many cases, that's okay. So, um, well, you know, well, but, but intent, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I could, yeah, I, go could for it. I, I can make the counter argument just as easily, which is we are as a society fundamentally lazy. Uh, mm -hmm. And ultimately, unless there is some level of regulation around what's okay and what's not, we will consume due excess. Uh, yeah. And there are certainly exceptions to that rule. There may be corners of society that care a lot about ESG and say, I personally don't need things delivered every day. But for the vast proportion of the mass market, I think hitting a button and expecting real time availability of whatever it is I just chose has now more than ever become an expectation. And so I think it's going to be hard to push back against that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you make a great point. I mean, you, you look at the, the conversion rates and it's like, do you really want to ask somebody who's ready to hit the buy button if they want to think about whether, you know, a longer delivery period would be cool? But uh, Crystal, you know, to kind of wrap up on, on the fulfillment, the shipping, the, the whole kind of global logistics question, any, any other thoughts, anything else you're seeing in your portfolio companies? I think continuing the thread on just... Um, sustainability, I think a lot of it will be very sort of consumer and cultural zeitgeist driven as well. And so I am seeing, you know, I'm, I'm a millennial, and I think I'm almost too old to quite appreciate this, but among younger consumers is a real push, you know, behind signaling that you're living in a sustainable way, that you care for the environment. There are a lot of brands started by people in their twenties now where the packaging is, you know, recyclable. Um, and so, there's more and more services that kind of orient, orient around that. And there's more, more social media activity around it. And I think um, retailers and brands will kind of be forced to move that way because consumers are kind of shaming them into doing that. And so I think mm -hmm. it will be very consumer led. And I do think it's happening in, in some pockets. Well, you know, let's start looking ahead. Obviously a lot of changes to consumer buying habits. Uh, you know, the, the sessions that, that we led off to the, the, the day with, you know, talked a little bit about how there've been product category shifts, um, you know, shift from beauty to health, uh, certainly some of the, uh, you know, folks like Reformation where their messaging has been, you know, nice dresses to wear to work. Suddenly it's dresses playing in, with the kids and bare feet in the backyard and things like that. So, you know, maybe, you know, take your investor's hat off and, and just tell us what you see uh, from a consumer, from an online shopper, as far as what are the most impactful changes to the shopping journey. Obviously, you know, we'll start with, with domestically, but you know, any insights that, that you might have, and, and Crystal, why don't we start with you as far as uh, the companies of yours that work internationally, we are certainly seeing, you know, significant changes to the customer journey. How does that impact the way you guys are, are kind of working with your direct to consumer and digital native brands to kind of be ready for the next phase of, of growth in e-commerce? Yeah, it's something we think about a lot because it's become so ruthlessly competitive to grow a D2C brand, right? A lot of the paid marketing acquisition channels are very saturated because there aren't that many to go after, right? There's Facebook, Instagram, you know, YouTube, buying keywords on Google. It's so that the cost of acquisition um, and of actually reaching scale on a new brand is, is quite high. And so we try to think a lot about, okay, well, how do you differentiate as a company in that regard, right? And on the one hand, um, you can sort of diversify your acquisition channels or, you know, do something more novel, like having social selling or having, you know, your influencers or community sell, or um, on the other hand, um, you can really sort of reinvent the, 
digital experience. And so I think more and more companies are rejecting a very templatized e-commerce storefront experience, right? And something that's very rigid. There's more and more talk about a headless approach where, um, you know, you take a set of composable APIs and you kind of construct your backend from scratch. You have more flexibility around um, payment schemes and other financial services you can embed at checkout, right? Like insurance or installment payments. Um, and you also just get faster performance on your website and, you know, a little bit more flexibility on the front end. And that's, that can be a costly investment, but it is another way that, you know, I think our brands are thinking about it. Um, but it's everything you can, you can do to make the digital experience faster, more unique, more different, and then trying to find lower cost channels for acquisition. Um, you know, for a long time, obviously, so that showrooming trend of having a digital experience, right? And um, maybe a few sort of marquee stores in downtown areas and using that to drive traffic to online. That was a big trend. Took a little bit of a hit with COVID, but it's still coming back, right? I actually um, recently did a panel with um, people at like T-Mobile and Wells Fargo who talked a lot about, well, we have a bunch of retail storefront that's just untrafficked now. And what do we do? We have to now turn those not into transactional hubs, but in places where we can drive customer loyalty and be consultative and really delight them. And so I think that that um, sort of movement is now coming back as well as sort of traf the traffic recovers a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. You just made me think of, you know, back to my, and I'm aging myself here, but, you know, we had, we had a company in the Southeast called Best Products, and that was exactly what you did. You went in and they had a couple of products, um, you know, on display, but most of the store was a, was a warehouse in the back. And as a kid, I love to see the product come down the conveyor belt and things like this. So yeah, these, the, you know, the, the rise of dark stores is something we talk a lot about. We were actually talking later today about, you know, whether some of these dark stores can become international fulfillment hubs for, you know, brands that, that don't have a, con, you know, obviously a, a brick and mortar platform internationally. Scott, any thoughts on, you know, kind of what you guys are looking at, maybe from a, a infrastructure perspective as, as the customer journey changes globally? Yeah, I mean, I think about this question from the vantage point of a shopper. And I think that's the, the great thing about commerce is that we're all customers of it. And so we all have a, a point of view. And on one hand, I'd say the, the consumer expectation around curation, personalization, uh, immediacy has only been heightened over the last year uh, as a result of you know, so much of our shopping behavior moving online. And some level of that is bound to persist from an expectation standpoint, because we've started to see it and experience it. And once you have it, it's a little like if you have clear in the airport and you skip the line, you really can't go back, back in a world where there were airports and people were flying, but we, we will get there again. And that's my other point, which is despite the fact that those expectations for consumers and their shopping mission have been, have been elevated, at the same time, we're getting back to real life again, very quickly. And as we're sitting here, certainly this summer and for sure this fall, I think the world for all of us is going to feel an awful lot like it used to, as opposed to an awful lot like it has been over the last, over the last 12 months. And I think what that means is that consumers will opt for continued online experiences for the stuff where that shopping mission is just easier, better, faster online. Mm -hmm. Like I may never go to a grocery store again. I just may not because I don't really like grocery shopping and it turns out I don't have to because everyone delivers to my house now. On the other hand, I like farmer's markets a lot and right. I'm for sure going to start stumbling around farmer's markets again and picking my own tomatoes and avocados because that's fun, but I don't need to do it for Cheerios. And so um, I think that the evolution that's going to unfold as it relates to retailers and brands is going to be managing that new balance where real life experiences matter again and brick and mortar fundamentally matters again. And, and I think that's going to hit everyone like a, a ton of bricks in the next few months. Well, you know, one thing that, you know, that this dark stores leads into this whole kind of, uh, you know, loss of discovery at the store level. We've seen social commerce come in. You know, we had Jake and his team at Facebook and Instagram talk about their discovery commerce, machine learning, AI driven, you know, targeting this idea of, um, you know, really using social as a discovery tool. Crystal, is that something that you're seeing among your brands? And I know we've got to wrap up here in a couple minutes, but, um, you know, let, let's talk a little bit about social. Sure. And well, social has been a big part of strategy, I think, for a couple of years now, right? Because it is a way to 
you know, build up a flywheel of fandom and, you know, always be accruing more customers, but also it's a pretty low cost way to get <laughs> traffic and engagement. And so it's a big part of it. Um, with that said, it is getting more and more competitive to find influencers who are valuable and impactful and aren't posting about 50 different things at the same time, right? And so there is a little bit of homogenization of Instagram content that's happening. And so that channel is also getting saturated, right? And so mm -hmm. um, you've got to find different ways to then engage those individual influencers, which is why we've also seen social retailing, right? And actually um, apps that help, you know, people in college actually sell and they actually have commissions and it's, um, so there, there's a little bit of maturation of that process, but it's, it's mattered a lot to us for a long time. Yeah. I mean, it's, if, if social, if influencers lose the authenticity, then that's when it kind of falls apart. I mean, I, I remember our first golf, you know, Hey, cross-border experience. It's all about authentic. Of course, we were talking more about products as opposed to counterfeits. Now the experience needs to be more authentic. Scott, how are you guys looking at that from a kind of a, a an infrastructure perspective, whether it's hyper personalization, you know, different ways of, of customer communication, you know, how do you get this more authentic feel to cross-border e-commerce? Well, I think one of the things that's happening is brands and retailers investing in the tools to touch their consumers in more personal ways. So as an example, you're seeing a kind of proliferation of SMS-based messaging from brands and consumers, as opposed to just email. Because email, no one looks at, and it hits spam filters. SMS is this very personal, personalized channel. It has to be used judiciously to be effective, mm -hmm. because if I send you a text every day, even if I'm your favorite brand, you're gonna turn me off. But if I send you a text periodically that recognizes who you are, what you bought from me in the past and offers you something interesting, you'll probably click and buy it. And so I think we'll see more and more of the kind of integration of shopping capabilities into the places we all live and work and behave kind of naturally. Right. And that'll just keep evolving as our habits evolve. That's the exciting thing about commerce is that it's always changing. Yeah, I mean, the whole shopper entertainment, you know, we saw live streaming, you know, maybe one of the buzzier things that came out of China early on. But, you know, I, I was, you know, I was doing a session with some guys from Burton and they were like, yeah, we were live streaming from, you know, our ski shops that were closed and, and it was we were doing great business. So, uh, you know, any thoughts on are you guys looking at live streaming, Crystal, things um, along those lines? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I used to work at a, a U.S. China fund, and so I've, I'm familiar with trying to find a deal in this space for maybe eight years now. Um, so definitely, really interested. Um, and I think you know the demand from the brand side has always been there, and the interest of influencers has always been there. But sort of the plumbing around tying what's being talked about to the checkout and closing that loop has actually always been a little bit hard. So the experience is never perfectly seamless. Um, but there are more and more companies emerging doing that. Um, and so it, we're actively looking all the time. All right, well, let's wrap up by, uh, sorry for the pun here, looking into our crystal balls, but um, uh, you know, if there was two or three things you guys could give advice to the Gulf audience, global e-commerce leaders, whether they're you know, digital natives or, or small folks selling internationally through Amazon and marketplaces, Maybe just a, a couple of words of advice or guidance as, you know, we come back to normal, hopefully, or whatever the new normal is going to be. Crystal, I'll, I'll go with you since I started with that bad pun. <laughs> sure. I mean, nothing particularly original, but I would say, you know, if you're a small business, you're a brand or a marketplace or a new retailer, just focusing on finding fanatically happy customers in the early days, mm -hmm. you don't necessarily need a hundred thousand of them if they're not going to be loyal, right? And if they're going to you know, burn your unit economics on incentives or discount anyways, right? Try to find a thousand or 5,000 super fans who will post everything, you know, post about you on Twitter, be really active on social media, because that's how you kind of make a small company appear much bigger than it is. And that will ultimately help you with product roadmap and development and everything else that follows. Awesome. And Scott, you've given us the, the fade to dark, uh, you know, kind of segue <laughs> into the end here. So uh, why don't you wrap up? Yeah, I noticed that. I'm not sure that must be. You You must have control over the special effect there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like somebody's ringing the bell. Okay, time to go, guys. I won't take it personally. My camera does that periodically. The only thing I'd say is, and, and I see this across sort of the Fortune 1000 retail and brand landscape, but I think it applies equally 
to kind of earlier stage or smaller brands and retailers. Um, you know, historically, I think uh, the commerce world has had uh, a conservative approach to technology adoption. Mm -hmm. They're uh, particularly the Fortune 1000. Their need to test and test and test and test before they roll things out has been extreme. And I lived this as an entrepreneur in this space and, and now as an investor in this space, really for my whole career. And yet when the pandemic hit, I saw a level of nimbleness that I'm not sure these companies thought they could achieve. I'll give you a great example. Michael's Stores, the craft retailers, happens to be a, a, a business that Bank Capital has been involved in for many years. Um, Michael's was testing online ordering with at store curbside pickup for like seven years. And it was going through multiple flavors of MVP and ultimate kind of initial trial. The pandemic hit and in one week, they had curbside pickup rolled out to the entire chain. Was wow. it perfect? Was it perfect? Nope. But did it get the job done? Yes. Could they improve it incrementally over time afterward? Yes. And it proved to them that they can make great leaps by being a little more ready, fire, aim as it relates to innovation. And so my advice to the group is, especially in this market where all of our consumers have been trained to have super high expectations, that you have to lean into technology innovation. And even if it's risky, feels risky, the benefits of being early and, and, and innovating over time far outweigh the costs. Yeah, exactly. Don't let perfect be the enemy of good. And in some cases, good is the way to go for cross-border. And Crystal, great point on finding your customer. I mean, one thing we tell people is don't get too hung up on whether you're going into the UK or Germany or South Korea or shuffling your priorities. Find where your customers are globally and, and go find them. So, hey, I really want to thank you guys for joining us today. Um, you know, big shout out to Juliana. Thanks uh, for helping pull everything together today. So, um, Coming up next, we'll have the case study and we'll be right back. So thanks everybody. Crystal, Scott, really appreciate it. Thank you, Ken. Thanks very much. Thanks.